If you haven't yet picked up a theme, uh, I will be going back and forth between the stage, the audience, uh, and, the, and, the, uh, and the podium here uh, throughout the next two days. We are going to try desperately to stay on time because it is a chock full uh, program. So let us transition uh, to this next speaker. Fittingly so. So the next panel, the next discussion is on US Coast Guard's Arctic perspectives. And uh, the speaker will be Admiral Charles Ray. He will then be joined by Melody Schreiber, who has also joined us on the stage from Arctic Today. So uh, the Admiral will give a presentation and then there will be an interview with, with Melody. And Melody, thank you so much for coming here today and for all the work you do with Arctic Today that keeps us all informed on what's happening in our world. Thank, thank you. you, thank you for coming. It is a pleasure now to introduce Admiral Charles Ray. He serves as the 31st Vice Commandant of the United States Coast Guard. His primary focus is to execute the Commandant's strategic intent and provide critical support to the Coast Guard's unique and challenging Arctic mission. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome to the podium Admiral Charles Ray. Everybody. Thank you, my friend. I really appreciate you being here. Good morning, everybody. How are you? Mike, thanks for the introduction. Melly, thanks for being here. And uh, I want to thank the Wilson Center in general and the U.S. National Ice Center and the U.S. Arctic Research Commission. Good to see you, Ms. Almer. And uh, thank you all for the opportunity to be here at this long-running and important symposium. It is a privilege for me to be here to talk about this uh, the highly consequential area of the world known as the Arctic and to uh, share with you the Coast Guard's perspectives on this at the strategic level. I'll be joined later. I see Admiral Matt Bell is here in the audience and he'll be speaking with you tomorrow with uh, talking about what we're actually doing up in the 17th Coast Guard District, which is Alaska and, and how we operate up there. So I will uh, uh, speak it more at the strategic level and then he will be preceded by uh, Vice Admiral Dan Abel, who will talk about, share on a panel about the military concerns. So my comments this morning will be a, a kind of twofold. One will be just a, how we see it from a maritime perspective, the changing in the Arctic and the call to action in that important region of the world and, and the Coast Guard's duties there. And then secondly, kind of how we're responding to that looking over the long run. And uh, there is no doubt that we have changes in the maritime region in the Arctic. As, as was mentioned by the senator, uh, there's a new ocean there. And, and while there are challenges, it's also an opportunity for us to assist the Coast Guard, to assist our nation, and in fact, the world in kind of getting it right, if you can, starting from the beginning part of this. And, and I'll also say that it's great to see the interest here today. About 11 or 12 years ago when I first started I was stationed in Alaska many years ago, but 11 or 12 years ago, we started talking about Arctic issues and trying to uh, generate support required to uh, recapitalize our icebreaker fleet. And at that time, it would have been a pretty small group. I think, uh, you know, there'd been about five or six of us there. We Hard to call a crowd, as you say. But thanks for the leadership, uh, especially of Senator Murkowski and others. We are... Uh, we are thankful to be here, and I'm glad to be a part of this organization. For those of you that aren't aware, and I think most of you are, this is, a, this is kind of a, uh, uh, one of the more informed audiences I'll ever have a chance to talk to about the Arctic. But just as a reminder, the Coast Guard, the U.S. Coast Guard, is no stranger to the region. We've been there for over 150 years, and, uh, and, and we've seen it change over the years, and we've served operationally from literally from the, you know, the, the, the Bering Sea to the far north, and, uh, and we understand what it takes to operate there, and we understand how it's changed. And we have an obligation to the citizens of, of our Arctic region, just as we have an obligation to the citizens uh, all around our country and other places, to be prepared to safeguard the nation's security, prosperity, and, and to provide this sort of a global influence that the Coast Guard can. As our nation's sole surface presence in the Arctic, we are fully aligned. I think we've got great support by this administration. I know we've got great support by the, those on the Hill and the leaders there. And so uh, we are committed to a free and fair access to the high latitudes. 
We just published uh, an updated 2013 strategic, or excuse me, an update to our 2013 Arctic study. We call it the Strategic Outlook. And, and it, was, uh, it was taken with, uh, we decided to update this. This is one of the first strategic documents that our new Commandant Admiral Schultz took on as he came aboard last year and I came with him. Um, and it, we did that for a reason. One, a lot has changed since 2013 in the Arctic. Uh, I think all those who live and, and work and serve there and, and study the region know that a lot has changed. And, and so while some things have, have remained the same in how we go about our duties, I think that this strategic outlook is a really clear-eyed approach to the competitive environment that exists there today. In our strategic outlook, we established three lines of effort. The first, and, and really from my perspective as an operator, the most important is that we've got to enhance our capability to operate in the Arctic region. And the second is that we, we must be a leader in strengthening rules-based order in that region. And I'll just briefly talk about that. And then finally, we must continue to innovate uh, and, and use, uh, you know, kind of advance in our methods to, uh, to promote resiliency and prosperity in the region. And as was mentioned before, we are in lockstep, I believe, with our brothers and sisters in the Pentagon. With re they just released an Arctic strategy, and we talk about a lot of the same things as we approach the region. Uh, although uh, the Coast Guard certainly has a distinct role from the Department of Defense. Now, I don't need to tell this audience about the call to action in the Arctic, but I'll just kind of emphasize a couple things that stick out from a maritime perspective. We've talked about the, uh, the energy perspectives there in the Arctic and the, and the challenges that associate with increased access by tourism and by cruise ships, and all those are true, and, and we are certainly leaning into those. But we also see other nations uh, seeking to shape the security environment to their own advantage. Uh, and, and that's just, I think that's the nature of, of nations of the world. They seek their own interest and uh, certainly Russia and China, I'll, I'll go ahead and you know, speak about them specifically. Uh, I think they have uh, demonstrated a tendency to be more aggressive in promoting their national interests there. And, and, that, and therefore our work and our presence there is all the more important. As was mentioned, Russia, that is a new frontier for them. And uh, certainly by any measure, the traffic along the Northern Sea Route is up and the trend is up. And, uh, and that is, uh, by the last time I checked, approximately 20% of Russia's total GDP are the, the uh, resources that, that they are uh, extracting there. Uh, and so, and they've, they've made it an effort and no secret that they're gonna reestablish Cold War bases. They, they've, they've fallen in with um, six new bases, deployed thousands of troops. They've certainly got approach of 50 icebreakers with plans to make 13 nuclear icebreakers. This is a strategic priority. Uh, likewise, uh, and, and so that's important to us in the Coast Guard. We have, we, they are literally, uh, you know, we, we see each other on the high seas. And more, as was stated, more and more, there are more high seas in the region. And so we have a reason to be able to uh, engage them and, and understand this with clear-eyed vision, because uh, those are multi-mission, multi -mission, multi-use assets that they're building and fielding. And while it may be defensive in nature, we just need to understand uh, the capability there. China is also investing significantly. I was, you know, they're creating new terms. I think Senator King kind of stole some of the thunder of this. I don't know where you get this near Arctic state, but that's what they said they are. And they are certainly uh, cooperating with the Russians on an economic front in, our uh, in terms of extracting energy. And I think that's the, obviously their own self-interest when it comes to uh, what they're doing. They've got, uh, they just finished building. I saw that they were getting ready to do ice trials for their second uh, icebreaker, the first one that they've built uh, in their own nation with plans to build a nuclear icebreaker. And uh, make no doubt about it, the Chinese are good shipbuilders. They can crank them out in, in record time. And so we should be mindful of that, that their capacity will uh, possibly exceed ours as we spool up the icebreaker program that I'll talk a little bit more in a minute. And, and so the competitive environment is clear, I think, or at least the potential for competition. Uh, just because there's potential for competition does not mean there's, we're predestined for conflict, but I think those, uh, we just need to understand the world that we're operating in and the potential. And so uh, in spite of this increased competition, I'll just say that your U.S. Coast Guard also, um, and our clear mandate 
to help with the national security. We also believe that we're well served with working with our partners across the region. Uh, this is stated in the uh, national security strategy that we'll cooperate when we can and be prepared to compete when we need to. But we have a long-standing tradition of cooperation with partner nations in the, in the Arctic, and we value those, and we think that they serve several purposes. I met in Finland in April with the Arctic Coast Guard Forum, and, and I will tell you, that group of leaders, it was, it was substantial, the work that we do. And this is an operationally focused organization. The work that we did and, and, and the, uh, the measures that we promoted in April as, and the exercises that we completed, they're invaluable. And I think they're probably more invaluable by the fact uh, that it's the time when you need a friend is not the time to meet a friend. So meeting them in advance is uh, certainly important, and we have great allies and partners in those Arctic nations. And it's also important, I think, these Arctic, um, the gatherings, whether it's the uh, Arctic Council, which we're on some of the working committees, uh, certainly we play a role in the International Maritime Organization, but at these, uh, these operational forums, it's really important because what we do is we get to know each other and we shed light, we kind of, these forums create a degree of dependent or transparency which is important when you want to understand what other people's motives and intentions. And, and so that's why we believe that they're certainly important for this effort. Um, as was stated, our new strategic outlook has three lines of effort. And, um, and, and the, the first I've kind of talked about, and in, in, uh, not the first, the, the second line of effort with regard to the rules-based order. That's what we get out of these forums. And, and by promoting the the actions of a responsible Coast Guard, we think that that leads to potentially kind of uh, uh, encouraging others who, who have a stripe on their vessel, as you see in the picture here, to also demonstrate responsible behavior. Uh, this, the first line of effort in our strategic outlook, and the one that I'm most um, interested in, is of course our ability to operate in the Arctic regions. And as the, the Senator was a leader, is a leader. As we, redo, as we develop our icebreaker fleet. And I can't tell you how important that is. Uh, because presence, in order to, to influence the region, in order to ensure our sovereignty, you have to be presence. And the Coast Guard is the, is the present operational entity on the surface in the Arctic. And, and so it is uh, critical that we are able to not just build this first one, but continue to build out our fleet because the idea, the objective here, and we call them polar security cutters. The icebreaker is just something they do. Uh, the reason we call them polar security cutters is because we need to be in the Arctic um, uh, year round uh, whenever the, the requirements are there. And you can't do that with one heavy icebreaker. You need a fleet of heavy icebreakers. And this was identified in 2010 in a high latitude study. We've been at this a while where we talked about the nation's needs in the Arctic region. And, and it was kind of uh, reconfirmed in 2017. I see my friend, Dr. Rebecca Pincus uh, in the audience and she and her group at the uh, Center for Arctic Studies at our Coast Guard Academy kind of uh, reconfirmed that most recently. And then the other part of our building operational capability is just what Senator Murkowski said. It's not just the stuff. It is, we rotate every year, and Admiral Bell will talk about this, we rotate every year a group of Coast Guardsmen through the Arctic region, beginning in the shoulder seasons when your ice first starts to recede, and then we stay there until up in the fall when it starts to come back in strength. And what we found is that we, we operate with the indigenous people of the Arctic we interact all across the North Slope and all the way down uh, towards the Bering Sea. And we found that we are more prepared to operate and serve in that region as a result of our interaction with the native peoples of the region. It is so important for us uh, to, to understand and learn from them. And so that's an important part of being prepared to operate in the region. And it's also important for our coasties to just uh, every year, you know, we cycle through. Uh, we rotate a third of our crews up in Alaska out every year. And so uh, every year we're educating a new crop of young Coast Guard women and men on how, what it means to serve and operate in the Arctic. And, and we do all sorts of Coast Guard missions there, whether it's search and rescue or whether it's fisheries enforcement or whether it's preparing for um, consequences of, of, of some of the other human activity up there. 
And then finally, the third part of our Arctic strategic outlook has to do with um, embracing innovation so that we promote resilience and prosperity in the region. And that is um, kind of an ongoing, if you will, there is where there's the, the kind of the old phrases that Senator Murkowski referred to, collaboration and cooperation. That's where a lot of that comes in. Because we have found that, that in any uh, um, contingency operation, that uh, it, is, it is best if you go as a team to address those. And so, uh, and it is best that you work to embrace technology moving forward. And so that's why every summer, when the Coast Guard Cutter Healy goes up there, we work with NOAA, we work with the Department of Defense, we work with uh, the state of Alaska, we work with uh, the local indigenous people of the region to, to conduct experiments, to conduct research and development on better ways to track, or heaven forbid, an oil spill in the Arctic regions, or to understand the, the patterns of the fisheries in the region, and then also to assist with the charting in the region that is so important. And so, uh, this, this kind of embracing of technology extends, uh, it, it's, it's a challenging place to operate in from, from any other perspective. And so it embraces the use of new technology for navigation. We launched some CubeSats last year that had a relatively short-lived life, but we were able to track them and learn from them. And what they did was bring the ability to communicate in the Arctic. So I will uh, wrap up by saying that it is a pleasure for me to be here. It is really uh, an honor for me to interact on the same stage with Senator Bukowski and Senator King and the other distinguished uh, folks that will follow. This is an important region for our nation. For too many years, this was the Arctic uh, challenges were seen as Alaska challenges. And I am thankful that now they're seen as national challenges. I'm thankful that we've taken the first step of what I hope will be uh, several steps to build out the capability that our nation needs to operate and serve the people in the region. And I, I am here to commit to you that your U.S. Coast Guard, just as we have for the last 150 years, is dedicated to ensuring the security, safety, and prosperity of this important region of our nation. So thank you, and I look forward to the interaction and, and hopefully uh, sharing some more with you. Thank you very much. Thank you for speaking. Um, so I want to first um, ask some of my own questions and then hopefully open it up to the audience. Um, okay, sounds good. Time, so keep that in mind and the microphones are here and there. So uh, you recently, the Coast Guard received funding for the icebreaker program. Um, congratulations on that. Um, how does the Coast Guard intend to maintain that momentum over the next several years for, for building Arctic assets? Our momentum is in that pink sweater going out the back door right now. <laughs> Senator Mikowski, you understand that? She asked how I was going to maintain momentum. I said, there's our momentum going out the back door. Thank you very much, ma'am. <laughs> now, I... I think, Melly, in all seriousness, I think what we've done is we've turned the corner, I believe, with regards to, and, 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 uh, with regards to the importance of the Arctic. And I think this competitive environment that has um, demonstrated itself of late, I believe that has gotten people's attention. And people understand that it's not just a, a place where few people live and few, few people have ever been. It's a place of important strategic significance. And I think it's also... Uh, an appreciation for the resources that are there and that uh, we need to have the capability to, to secure those resources and to secure the people that live there and to secure the approaches to our nation. So I think it's a combination of things that will keep us going. I, I'm pretty confident. I, I'm eternally optimistic anyway, but it is, uh, uh, I think uh, the support we've seen across the board uh, on the Hill and with the administration uh, is, is evidence that people understand that we need to be able to serve and operate up there. And the second and third icebreakers you're planning for FY21, are you fairly confident that would happen? Yeah, I, th I think so. I, I mean, it takes resources for sure. And as, as Senator Murkowski so aptly put it, there's, a con you know, there's always, there's never enough to go around uh, for all the um, important 
things that, that people are interested in and that believe in in our nation and the democracy. However, I think there's a growing consensus. And I, in fact, I think we've turned the corner that this is a region we can no longer afford. I'll tell you, this is so last year I testified before a committee about icebreakers and about why we needed them. And so I asked the guys, I said, look, Go back and look at all the, uh, the documentation we've had since we started talking about recapitalizing our fleet. And they pulled up some documents from 1984. And they were essentially saying the same things I was saying in 2018. So it took us a while, but we finally kind of uh, uh, broke squelch on that, as we say in the military. And, uh, and we got things moving. And so I think that now that it's moving, uh, I really believe that we'll keep it moving. And another priority of Senator Murkowski's, as we heard today, is other types of infrastructure, more permanent, less mobile, such as a network of ports or deepwater Arctic port. Um, what's the Coast Guard's prioritization of that? What is there anything in the works there for supporting that? Well, it's a, it's a great question. It's one that's asked often. It's one that's debated quite a bit uh, in terms of priorities for the nation. Now, the Coast Guard, there's no doubt we would benefit from a deep water, it's, it, basically it's a deep water port somewhere north of Dutch Harbor. Uh, and we would benefit from that. And uh, it, it, so it, that's uh, 800 miles is a long ways from Dutch Harbor to, uh, to getting through the Bering Straits and the North Slope. And uh, so that would be a benefit. Um, and you mentioned the strategic importance of the Arctic, and this is the geopolitical competition was a really big part of the recently released strategic outlook. Um, but there, there's more than than just that to the Coast Guard's missions and what it actually does in the Arctic. Um, there's there, a, a big part of it is supporting science. Um, and I know this administration hasn't necessarily always been friendly towards science, but Congress has. Um, so why hasn't that been sort of a, a forefront like in, in the effort to procure more resources? Well, you know, uh, if I understand your question, why has that bit not been more successful? I, that's a good question. I mean, you know, we've spent, uh, the nation is an observer, a close observer of, of science and a, and a close partner with the National Science Foundation. Uh, we support their mission in Antarctica, and we are the primary means of, uh, of them being able to carry out that mission in Antarctica. So I think that, uh, by and large, I mean, our, our nation's uh, scientific uh, endeavors have been supported with regards to Coast Guard and the interaction. Uh, we, we are, uh, there's no really backing down on our support of science. When Healy sails uh, to the Arctic this summer. They will be doing scientific research, uh, and I don't know the specific experiments, but we always do, and along with research and development for other operational things. So there's some science that can only be done in the Arctic or the Antarctic, in the polar regions, and so we certainly support that on both ends of the Earth, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we will continue to do so. And in terms of how you position it, sort of outwardly focused, like looking at your long-term strategic outlook, um, do you think that there is any sort of um, conflict or competition between between positioning your role as a as a sort of national defense um, service versus all the other missions you do? Is is that going to sort of suck up some of the resources, or are the are there any sort of long-term effects to that positioning? Well, uh, I mean, ideally, there would be a growth in the resources for the Coast Guard. That's, I mean, you, 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 you know, you can only spread things uh, so thin. And so, uh, and we've gone into the conversation recently that this is not a uh, something for nothing. And, and I think that's been recognized by both the administration and the Hill. And so uh, a growth in resources is evidenced by this uh, almost a billion dollars that was appropriated for the first polar icebreaker. That's the kind of support it will require for us to uh, continue to increase our presence in the Arctic, operate in the Arctic while not diminishing our presence in other places on the planet where we operate. And we do operate literally around the planet, but, but more specifically right around, you know, the approaches to the, the lower 48. So uh, uh, it's just gonna have to be an increase. And we've seen the indications that that's supported by both the administration and the Congress. So once again, I'm optimistic, Melanie. Um, and at a recent hearing before the House, um, a, you mentioned cooperation with the Navy on their strategic outlook um, and that you had a chance to review their, their strategy. Um, 
yet the Navy classifies the Arctic as a region of low conflict, and, and the, their document was a lot, um, a, a lot shorter, <laughs> less um, detailed than the Coast Guard. So how, how are you continuing to work with them? Why, why are there, it seems like there, there's sort of a difference between how you're perceiving um, threats in the Arctic? Well, uh, I'll talk first about a real positive interaction with the U.S. Navy that's, uh, uh, and, and all of our interaction is by and large positive, but really, I mean, we would not be where we are with the polar security cutter, uh, with that contract, with that where, you know, kind of moving forward uh, in, in the, uh, the fact that we, we signed that contract in April of this year. We wouldn't be, uh, we wouldn't be anywhere near that were it not for the cooperation with the U.S. Navy that we've had and their shipbuilding program. And so a tremendous support for that. It's an integrated program office and we'll continue to work that way. And so we kind of get the best because our nation hadn't built a, a heavy icebreaker in several decades. And so uh, what we found in dealing with the Navy was that it's not unlike some of the special type construction they do for submarines or other things. So the expertise they bring to that is, uh, has been important and it's beneficial to our service. And the, the Secretary of the Navy could not, could not be more supportive than he has been of the Coast Guard in general and of our Arctic nation, our Arctic missions in particular. With regards to the rest of the Navy's priorities, I won't speak for the, uh, the Navy except to say that they, uh, they have a lot on their plate and they are, uh, you know, they are weighing priorities and threats to the nation on a, you know, on a regular basis and so uh, they'll make their determination accordingly. And beyond collaboration on the icebreaker program, um, what about the surface presence? It, the Coast Guard is still the, the sole surface presence in the Arctic. Is that likely to change? Are you? Well, it, it, I think it already has changed. We sailed north. Uh, this is on the Atlantic side, on the east side of the Arctic last year in a major exercise for the first time in I don't know how long. And so there was Navy ship. There were Navy ships participating in that. There were Navy ships or Marines participating in that exercise. So a substantive exercise, we'll say, you know, on the Greenland side of the United States. Uh, and, and likewise, we're looking at it, uh, an exercise, uh, potential exercise out in the Aleutians this fall. And so the Navy will sail into the into the Arctic waters and has sailed there. And, and I think that, you know, it's, uh, they, they understand. I mean, they're the world's greatest Navy by any, any imagination. Uh, but uh, they understand that in order to operate an area, you have to practice where you operate. And so they are going about doing that. And um, so you, the Coast Guard recently released its strategic outlook for the Arctic. Um, and the Coast Guard is part of the Department of Homeland Security. Is there still an Arctic strategy from the Department of Homeland Security in the works? When might, when might we see that? Has that been rolled up into DOD? No, it has not been rolled up, and, and I don't have a prediction for when that will be published. I mean, the, the department understands uh, uh, the, that the Coast Guard uh, is the leader within our department in this region, and so I think the fact that we, uh, and we're certainly working and great support from the Department of Homeland Security for our Arctic initiatives. And so they, I think they, they uh, are, are, are well served by the strategic outlook that we've published. And so we haven't, you know, gone much further down the road than that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and then I think uh, there are no questions from the audience, so we'll keep going. Um, so I, I did notice in the strategic outlook there was quite a bit of, of um, discussion of the changes to the physical environment, but that it stopped just short of mentioning climate change. Um, and I know that in this administration that has been a somewhat controversial <laughs> topic. Um, so what are the potential um, issues that could arise from, from sort of not addressing climate change head on? Just talking, I know preparing for the physical changes is, is going to be important no matter what you call it, but w why not have a long-term climate strategy? Well, I'm not in the climate strategy business. <laughs> I, 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 I'm in the Coast Guard operating business, and and, uh, and I don't I don't say that lightly. I mean, you know, we've said all along. Our, four commandants ago, we've been talking about the uh, the Arctic and the requirement to operate there, and and quite frankly, we're agnostic. I'll just you know, we are really agnostic when it, there's just water where there used to be ice, 
And so therefore, that same water we have the responsibility to operate in uh, off of Nome, the same as I do off of Fort Lauderdale. Uh, different missions, but uh, same requirement for Coast Guard presence there to serve the people. So, uh, you know, whether it's cyclical or it, it, we just, that's not part of, uh, that's not part of my uh, kind of world of work, if you will. Uh, now, I do have the requirement to plan our facilities that are, and all of our facilities around the country are, you know, uh, adjacent to the water, obviously, for the most part. And so we plan resilience in those facilities and it, with the kind of acknowledgement that the, that the ocean is changing, the environment we operate in is changing. So every new thing that we do takes that into account. Um, and you also mentioned um, Russia and China in your prepared remarks. Are there other countries that are on your radar, other near peer competitors or others that um, you're sort of keeping an eye on in terms of geopolitics? Well, you know, I think those are the two that come to mind. I mean, there is, um, we, uh, we have great relations uh, with the other, uh, well, we have great relations with the Russians. I, you know, I gotta say, uh, um, on the one hand, we understand that Russia is upping its game in the Arctic, and we understand that they are increasing their military presence there. On the other hand, Admiral Bell, who's sitting in the audience there, is the 17th District Commander. He has an ongoing relationship with the Russian border guard because we, have, we share a border. And so it is critically important, uh, as was stated earlier, you, you want to be able to pick up the phone and talk to people. And we have great cooperation with them, whether it comes to illegal fishing, or whether it comes to a search and rescue cases that happen on the seam, or one uh, of the seam I'm talking about between our international boundaries, uh, and or uh, a potential oil spill or anything. And we worked all these issues in the last four or five years. And so, uh, but you know, it's, there's a requirement to do that. Uh, with regards to the other Arctic nations, I could not be, uh, I think the Arctic Coast Guard Forum, it follows a forum that we've operated for 20 years called the North Pacific Coast Guard Forum. And we really focus on operational issues. We focus on things that, that we know that we share an interest in, whether it's fisheries enforcement, uh, oil spill uh, response, or, or any other sort of Coast Guard-like missions. And so the Arctic Coast Guard Forum is similar to that in that we, we focus on, on issues that we need to be, uh, that we have shared interest. All at the same time, and, and we're allowed to do this. We're allowed to kind of think on different planes, you know. On the one hand, you, you deal and you cooperate and you collaborate. On the other hand, you kind of realize that, that uh, other people are, are working in their own interest and maybe their own interest does not exactly correspond to our national interest. And so we just have to do that wide-eyed and, and ready and operate accordingly. Great. Um, I think we have a question from the audience. Good morning, sir. Thank you for um, talking to us today. I was on the Healy um, last summer, and um, you talked a lot today about uh, the need for a security fleet in the Arctic, but the primary mission of the Healy is science. So my question is, um, will this, are there plans in place to have the security fleet also act, um, also help in the science mission in the Arctic? Um, will, their, will their ships be capable of performing dual missions? Um, because I know on the Healy, one of the biggest problems was timing, not being able to fit everything in that we wanted, um, having to leave before scientists maybe got exactly the data that they need or um, having to go into shipyard so can those science missions kind of be spread out among other ships? That's, that's one of the reasons precisely why we need a bigger fleet. So great question. Um, yes, we will continue. In fact, on, on the new, the designs for our new polar security cutters, we have weight and space and capacity for science mission kind of, uh, you know, packages, if you will, that we would bring in uh, as we got ready to sail. Uh, specifically designed for whatever kind of science we would do it. And you know, science is, is the Venn diagram of science and research development, they, they overlap quite a bit. And the research and development is certainly important, not just for science for science sake, but for our ability to operate. So I don't ever foresee a day. And as I look back through the history, if you exclude World War II, when we were using icebreakers specifically for defensive reasons up around Greenland and other places, if you get past that, I don't know that we've sailed 
a single time since 1946 where there hasn't been a science element to, to the mission. So we're glad to do that. Thank you. All right. I think that's our time. All right, Michael, th we call this where I come from the hook. Yeah, Th this, this, is, this is the polite hook. It does a number of things. Unfortunately, it stops a great conversation that's appreciated by all. It also socializes the, the fact that I will do this often throughout the day to try to keep us on schedule. So I want to thank Melody from Arctic today. Thank you so very much for being with us and great questions. Admiral, thank you for your time and your insight and thank you for your leadership. Ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Thank you, Billy. Appreciate it, ma'am. Thank you. Well, then the next presentation is uh, absolutely perfectly scheduled. I know that because John Farrell scheduled it. Uh, it's an Arctic environment scene setter. And to introduce this panel or this presentation, uh, we've asked the Honorable Fran Ulmer to do so. She, as many of you know, is the chair of the United States Arctic Research Commission. She is the former lieutenant governor of the state of Alaska. She served as special advisor to Secretary of State John Kerry for Arctic Science and Policy from 2014 to 2017. And she currently serves as a senior fellow at the Arctic Initiative at the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center, a program and a school that the Wilson Center has a wonderful relationship. So please welcome to the podium, Fran Ulmer. Thank you, Mike. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Whether you are from the Arctic or just wish that you were up there for cooler temperatures today, uh, I want to say we're very, ha very happy that you are here. This is an amazing opportunity for all of us to listen and to learn and to share ideas about the Arctic, its future, and our responsibilities to this region of our planet. The opportunity to listen to people is really why most of us decided to come. And because of the amazing range of speakers, uh, I just want to prepare you for the next speaker, who has been a research scientist, a research engineer for over 30 years. But before I introduce her, I just want to say a couple of words about the Arctic Research Commission, one of your hosts today. Uh, and I'm just going to cover three quick points. Uh, what is our purpose? What are our principal priorities? And how does the process work? And just very, very briefly, when the Congress created the Arctic Research Commission way back in 1984, it was really to have an entity created by the government that focused attention on important Arctic research priorities. And we have done that over the years by focusing on priorities that are really important for the entire federal agency family, but also for universities, for the private sector, and for the public to think about, to focus on, to invest in, and to prioritize. And we do that by calling out priorities in what we call our goals research report, which we do every two years. But we also do it by interacting with the various entities that in the federal government are responsible for doing Arctic research and for incorporating that research effort into the federal agency responsibilities in the Arctic. And so the process, which was sort of laid out, involves the creation of a five-year Arctic research plan. And if you've never gone to the web to see it and, and to read it, I would encourage you to do that. If, you're, if your curiosity has been piqued about what is it that the federal government should be focusing on and does focus on in terms of Arctic research, going to that five-year plan, which is constructed by the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee with the assistance of the US Arctic Research Commission might be very, very helpful to you. One of the other ways in which, through process, we are able to engage in the mission that Congress asked us to do is through information sharing. And that's partly why we did this very first symposium with the Navy back in 2001. 
So it goes back a long way, and we went from about 50 people participating to over 600 people participating, and we're, again, very, very happy that you are here. But another way in which we provide that information, which I want to share with you, if you aren't already on the very important list to get your daily update from the US Arctic Research Commission, go to arctic.gov. Arctic.gov is a very easy thing to remember. If you go there, you will have access to a lot of information, and you can sign up for the daily update, which will keep you up to date on what's going on in the Arctic in general, in policy, but also most importantly in terms of research. So Jackie Richter Menge has been a research engineer for many years at the US Army Corps of Engineers Cold Regions Lab. She recently retired. She is now affiliated with the University of Alaska Fairbanks and with Dartmouth, and continues to do her work in a variety of ways, including serving on the US Arctic Research Commission. She was appointed by President Obama back in 2016. Her research has really has focused on a comprehensive view of what is going on in terms of Arctic sea ice cover, which means she has spent a lot of time in the field, and it means that her work is a very important part of helping us understand not only the change that has taken place in the Arctic, but meeting the operational needs of a whole host of agencies, including the US Coast Guard. And uh, rumor has it she also makes fabulous maple syrup. So without any further ado, please welcome Jackie Richter Menke. Well, thank you. Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you, Fran, for that kind introduction. And thank you very much to the organizing committee for inviting me here today to talk about the environmental conditions in the region that are at the core of the discussion, and that is the Arctic. I like an easy job. Um, my husband, who makes the maple syrup, will let you know that. Um, and my job is easy today because there are a lot of warming signs that are affiliated with the diminished ice Arctic. The challenge that I had today was deciding which ones to highlight, so hopefully I'll do the job justice. Now, this is an interesting point that was actually made by Senator Murkowski. I'll back her up on this. When you talk about the Arctic from an environmental perspective, there are no boundaries. I'm sure later today we'll see maps of how you define the Arctic. But in fact, the Arctic is part of the global system. It's an important part of the global system. It affects the global system and is affected by the global system. So it really is one great big planet that we're working on. Fortunately, we have technologies that can monitor the changes that are going on. Satellites have been available to monitor changes in the Arctic region uh, since 1979, so for 40 years now. And what they allow us to do is to monitor the Arctic constantly, and specifically its sea ice cover. We get to watch uh, when the Arctic sea ice cover reaches its maximum extent, which is usually in March after a, a cold, dark winter. And we get to see when it recedes to its minimum, typically in September. So the, the Arctic is basically growing and shrinking over time. What I want to do is to use that information now to show you what's been happening every year since satellites have been available um, and how things have changed as far as that winter maximum in March and the summer minimum in September. You can see that here. Over the 40-year period, the winter is in black and the summer is in red. You see a lot of variability in both of these trend lines, but we expect that. Just as in your own home place, sometimes the summers are cold and dry, and other times they're warm and wet. So you see a lot of variability, but what we're talking about when we talk about things climatically is the trend that we're seeing. And in both cases, you can see that there is a downward trend, and they are significant. 
The trend in the summer is much more uh, notable, but uh, the trend in the winter is still very important. Um, it is not just that trend, but how it's affecting the peoples that live there, the ecosystem that depends on it, and in fact, the accessibility, which is again, the reason for us being here. Now, if I did this for any month of the year, you would see the same sort of declining trend. Let's just take a snapshot of what the Arctic looked like in September of 1980 compared to the uh, summer of 2018. And you can really see the difference here. In 1980, pretty typical, in the summertime after the sea ice has receded to its minimum, the Arctic basin is still filled with ice. You can see that's not the case in, in 2018. And it's important not only the fact that the sea ice cover is smaller now in the summer, it's where it's smaller. And again, while we're here discussing it, we've lost ice, we're losing ice in the peripheral regions along the north coast of Alaska and also along the uh, Eurasian continent, which is this increased accessibility. Now, it's not just about the changes in the extent of the ice cover. It's about changes in the thickness of the ice cover. And Senator King's, uh, the video that he showed uh, is actually, I've taken a couple snapshots here. You're looking at uh, the ice age, which is a proxy for the thickness. The older ice is, the thicker it can get. And you can see March of 1985 on the left compared to March 2018. And the oldest ice here is shown in white. It is striking to see that the basin in 1980 was filled of older, thicker ice. That ice is largely gone now in March of 2018. Now it makes sense if you think about why this is happening. You see these pictures of the ice cover receding in the summertime. It grows back in the wintertime. When it grows back in the wintertime, it's thin and it's more vulnerable. So when the summer comes on and melt happens, that ice melts back. And so it's very difficult to build up this older, thicker ice. And in fact, with the trends expecting that there's going to continue to be warming temperatures, this is going to continue to happen. Now, satellites are good, but I think eyewitnesses are better. And that's actually what I've been able to do over my career, is to see this change happening. And that in itself is remarkable. I've been a researcher for 35 years, and typically changes on the planet Earth don't happen this quickly. But I have been able to actually witness that. I can also tell you from an aging standpoint, it's hard to tell that you're getting older when you're in all that polar gear. So that's kind of a nice thing too. But I haven't gotten around much in the Arctic. I didn't get to see Santa at the North Pole. I haven't gotten to see the coasts of Greenland. I have largely done all of my research, well not largely, I have done all my research in the Beaufort Sea region. Now from a standpoint of being able to tell people where I've been, it's not very impressive. The good news is that it's really allowed me to watch what's happening in this particular region of the Arctic. As orientation, you'll see that that's the north coast of Alaska. You can see Ukiavik, uh, formerly known, uh, called out as Barrow. Now, I'm just going to give you a sense of two pictures from and some field notes taken in uh, my field book of 1982, and I did save them, uh, and uh, my most recent trip to the Arctic in 2018. On the left is the uh, 1982 when I was up in the Arctic collecting samples uh, to bring back to the laboratory to test. We were 25 miles off the coast of Prudhoe Bay or Dead Horse. My field report is contained a wide variety of multi-year flows and was convenient to Dead Horse, Alaska. We were basically a hop, skip, and a jump from Dead Horse, really overuse of a helicopter. But they're fun, so we drove one anyway. Fast forward to... 2018 when I was out helping support the Navy ice camp. 200 miles, 10 times the distance off of Prudhoe Bay. The report says lots of thin and fractured first year ice on the way out to identify a multi-year flow. That's the thicker ice that I've been talking about. Um, 
options for the ice camp are very limited. I want to blow up these pictures so that you can see the difference yourself. On the left, 25 miles off of Prudhoe Bay, and on the right, February 2018. And you can see yourself that that is a really thick, robust ice on the left-hand side. You see that middle part that has kind of up high in the air? That's thick ice. It's floating higher because it's thicker. There's a large ridge running through that, refrozen ridge. That ridge was 30 meters thick, 90 feet thick. We drilled through it. OK, that is not the picture in February 2018. All the way out to this camp location, 200 miles off the coast, we saw this very fractured ice. The reason that you see the darkness here is it's very thin ice. You're actually seeing the ocean underneath of it. That's how thin it was. Certainly not a place you want to land a helicopter or a plane or put an ice camp. And to understand why we're seeing that, look at what the summers were like in the years preceding those uh, photographs. In September 1981, you see the basin is filled with ice, this old thick ice. So it's there and it's available. And September 2017, it had receded way off the coast. So when the winter again came on, that ice was first year ice. Now I want to spend a little bit of time about that, my time with an ice ex, uh, at, during the 2018 exercise, because it gives a good example of what the conditions are in the Arctic now, but also the challenges of operating in the Arctic. Now the ISEX exercises are coordinated by the US Navy uh, Arctic Submarine Laboratory. They are Navy exercises to help the submarine force maintain an Arctic capability. And more generally, they help the Navy and its contractors understand the challenges of operating in the Arctic. Really super cool picture up in the top left-hand side. You can see three submarines that have surfaced at the Arctic, two US and one uh, British submarine. This particular exercise was uh, coordinated in collaboration with uh, US Navy, British Navy, and the Canadian Navy. My job in this, as part of a team from the United, uh, from University of Alaska Fairbanks, was to find the flow. Find the flow that was going to be the, ha the home for the ice camp in support of these exercises. Um, we did this in conjunction with the National Ice Center. Now, there were a whole list of criteria. The flow needed to be thick, multi-year ice. It needed, at the time of deployment, to be no further than 250 nautical miles from Dead Horse so that it could be supported by planes. It couldn't be any closer than 150 nautical miles so that submarines could operate safely. The flow sizes needed to be about five to 10 miles in diameter so it's nice and robust and not gonna fall apart. It needed to be rounded and shaped for the same reason, it's more robust that way. And on top of it, you needed to have some first year ice ac access next to it so that planes could land on this flatter ice type. What I wanna draw your attention to on this timeline is to find the candidate flows took uh, eight weeks, almost two months of time, and the camp was deployed for three weeks. So finding the flow, not to mention the amount of work that's going on behind the scenes by the Arctic Submarine Laboratory to coordinate this ice camp, took more than two times for the, the length of time the camp was deployed. Just to give you a snapshot of what the three major steps were in finding the flow, First off, the Arctic sea ice cover is not st uh, steady state, it's dynamic, it moves. You can see on the top left, this is looking for a flow started in January. We start looking for a flow up along the Canadian coast near Banks Island because we know that that ice is going to flow down along the Canadian coast and, and be north of Alaska. We tracked 15 flows over time. In uh, late February, went to Kodiak, got on a C-130, flew out over the ice cover to look uh, at these potential candidates and drop position buoys on them. And those position buoys were used in our Pioneer survey flights where we actually take a small plane out, land on the ice if we can, and kick the tires of the flows that we've picked. This gives us a chance to be on the ice, make some confirming measurements about its thickness, look at the snow cover and its general proximity. 
Here's what we picked. There's home sweet home. You can see dead horse uh, over here, Gavik, uh, um, and uh, you can see the concentric circles are showing you locations from dead horse. The purple is 150 nautical miles. The green is 250, so we needed to be in that band for operation. The green lines are how the ice is being predicted that it's going to drift. What I really want to draw your attention to, though, is the satellite imagery that you see highlighted here where I say home sweet home. These are radar set images. Thick multi-year ice lights up as white. Dark in those images is first year ice. You can see that we did not have much of an opportunity to look for candidate flows. You really can see, if I get this pointer. Well, you can see, can you see the band here that I'm talking about, this white band where the red is? That was it for what flows were out there to go put this camp on. Versus my earlier experience, that would have been filled with candidate flows. Very different situation. Whoop, went back. And here's what can ice camp skate looked like. Okay, you can see where the Navy has put out their camp. You can actually see the edge of the multi-year flow here, very close to where the camp is. And you can see the flat region there. That's the first year ice we were looking for. And you can actually see the runway that's being groomed for the planes that are going to come in and support the mission. Okay, no matter when I've been out on the ice, cracks happen. And this happened on March 18th, so the camp was deployed the 1st of March, 18th of March. We began to see a series of cracks, and actually one is close to camp here and caused a, you know, a little consternation, as you might expect. Uh, actually started to look for some backup runways. And actually, this was a prelude of things to come. Here is the conditions in the 23rd of March. And you can see the ice camp again outlined in red. And you can see it's not just one crack. It is in a large system of cracks that are emanating off uh, the point barrow and um, you know, going off in uh, this direction of the camp. And I showed this particular image to my dad at the breakfast table. My dad, who is not an Arctic scientist, said, is all that black stuff cracks in the ice? That does not look good. And in fact, I said, Dad, that is not good. And that is why we're telling the Navy that they should think about demobilizing, which they did. And they were able to quite quickly. So this is just indicative of this new environment that we're in. The ice is drifting a lot because we have this early first year ice. You can look here historically in, in ISEX 2018 and 2016, the ice drifted 160 miles in a matter of two to three weeks. Go and look historically, the ice didn't move that far. And in fact, some of those camps were two months long where we didn't get that amount of drift. But with this thinner ice, it is more dynamic. Now, the sea ice cover isn't the only thing that's showing us that the Arctic is warming very quickly. I'm going to just pick out a little things out of the Arctic report card, which is another resource that will show you annually an update on environmental conditions. The we see the Greenland ice mass is decreasing. We see that with the receding sea ice cover, we have warming surface temperatures in the ocean and the peripheral seas. And the persistence of this warming is affecting the ecosystem that's there. Here's just an example comparing the distribution of types of fish in the Barents Sea in 2004 compared to 2012. And you can see there's a northern migration of fish types. Uh, the southern fish are more adaptable, so they can live in a whole variety of different conditions. Arctic fish, on the other hand, are kind of picky, so they're, it's, this is happening at their expense. So there are plenty of warming signs around this diminished ice arctic. I want to leave you with just a couple thoughts um, on top of this. I'm just going to use the floor to, uh, to extend my uh, purview. First off, I am thrilled to hear more and more about the inclusiveness of the indigenous voice. This is a stark reminder that ignoring this voice can be the difference between failure and success. These are just two pictures, Franklin and Amundsen. You hear a lot about Franklin, who was looking for the Northwest Passage because he didn't make it. He basically lost, the whole expedition was lost. Roald Amundsen on the other side made it, 
And you can see stark difference between how they're dressed here. Franklin refused to listen to the indigenous voice. Roald Amundsen embraced it. So it's an important perspective and a collaboration that I hope only continues to grow. OK. The why matters. OK, we just heard, like, OK, we're not going to talk about climate change or why this is happening. You can't, you can't have your cake and eat it, too, on this particular thing. You can't plan without understanding why. You really have to understand why we're seeing these changes and what changes are coming ahead of us. Because the why is how we learn to predict and how we can plan. So you can't get around it. And I'm going to thank you for your time. I'm going to leave you with a little bit of e-swag that you've already heard some about. Uh, in the bottom, Fran already mentioned the uh, Arctic update. Uh, that's put out by the Research Commission. If you haven't signed up for it, do. It's always interesting to read. It tells you about what's going on and also, also tid great tidbits from, uh, uh, picked out from the media. Um, I already mentioned the Arctic Report Card, which again is an annual update that comes out with a whole lot of information about environmental conditions. And in the center here is the IARPIC collaboration put out by the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee. It's a great hub of communication. Um, it's, again, an easy thing to join, and you can participate as much as you want. So thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to the rest of the meeting. You're all good. Thank you, Jackie, so much uh, for that wonderful but a little bit unsettling presentation. Just one, a couple of orders of business. We've been asked about lunch. There are maps outside on a table that have all the lunch areas within the building and outside of the building, so you'll see those out there. Uh, give me one moment to introduce two uh, special people to us. The first sitting here in the front row. The first is, is Alice Rogoff. Alice, would you just stand so we can recognize you? Thank you, Alice. I don't know who doesn't know Alice, but, but let me just remind us of one thing. One is that Alice, along with me, Treadwell, who I'll embarrass in a moment, was really the driving force behind the Wilson Center creating what is now a Polar Institute, also the driver behind what is now the Arctic Circle, and a driver behind the Harvard's effort in the Arctic Initiative. So Alice is sort of our Venn diagram of get things done in the Arctic, and none of us would be doing our work if it wasn't for Alice Rogoff. Alice, thank you. And of course, Mead, Mead Treadwell's here. I don't know anybody who doesn't know Mead, but Mead is here as well. Uh, Mead, former Lieutenant Governor of the State of Alaska, former Chair of the US Arctic Research Commission with Alice, uh, went to Jane Harmon and uh, pitched the idea of this Polar Institute. So without Mead and Alice, again, the Venn diagram just doesn't work. Forum like this do not take place, and the important work isn't advanced. I want to thank you for thanking both of them for creating the foundation upon which we all do our work. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are going to take a break. It'll be a hard break. It'll end at 10.30. Coffee and things are already out there. I know it's been a good and full morning. At 10.30, please, with Dr. Gallaudet. Thank you very much.